Uh, sorry, this was uh, missed last Thursday because we overran our time. So this is the final part of the three talks on Orientalism. We analyzed some of the basic roots of this problem. And today we want to see what can be the consequences. There is a term in English called dog whistle. Um, it's like hinting without taking responsibility for it. So you see big politicians, they talk against immigration or something and then the ground troops, they make all the trouble. So let's see what are these dog whistles in history we can see. So for example, this is not new, it is old. There is a thing from 1977 and a person called Sir Richard Dobson who was uh, CEO of uh, British American Tobacco, which is one of the biggest tobacco companies and then later British Leyland. On 27th of September 1977, Sir Richard Dobson was invited by the 20 Club to give a talk at the Dorchester Hotel in London. Those of you who are following the news will see the 20 Club was very much in the news, uh, I think early this year or late last year, when they had uh, abused women and these 20 big CEOs and they had, now it's closed down. So that's the club, okay, it's an exclusive club. His speech was secretly recorded and later released to the media by Tariq Ali, who was one of the campaigners for this kind of thing. During his speech, Sir Richard referred to allegations that British Leyland has a slush fund for making payments to foreign countries to assist orders, bribes, roughly, right? So he said that those allegations were accusing the company of perfectly respectable fact that it was bribing votes. Not only that, he's apologizing, he's saying this is quite respectable, those guys need to be bribed. There's no other way to get business. They are not us, they are them. Then uh, there is a man called Lawrence Summers who at that time was the uh, chief economist of the World Bank. Later, he became president of Harvard University. Uh, later, he became part of the Economic Advisory Council of President Obama, and still he is a prominent economist, okay? So, he wrote a memo, just between you and me, shouldn't the World Bank be encouraging more migration of the dirty industries to the least developed countries. So wrote Treasury Secretary designee Lawrence Sumners, then the chief economist at the World Bank in 1991. A World Bank internal memorandum arguing for the transfer of waste and dirty industries from industrialized to developing countries. There's more. I think, he said, the economic logic behind dumping a lot of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable and we, sh we should face up to that. I always thought that underpopulated countries in Africa are vastly underpolluted. Their air quality is vastly inefficiently low compared to Los Angeles or Mexico City. Those who are following the news will see that only today, Malaysia has finally decided to send this rubbish back to where it came from. Philippines is threatening to dump Canadian rubbish which was sent there. Indonesia is doing the same. And China has stopped getting rubbish, plastic from us altogether. So we now have to think about what to do about our plastics. We can't dump it on these poor people who are not human beings, even if we pay them, right? So this is not new, this is 1991. Uh, these are the attitudes which build up that these people are not us, they are different, they are lower, they don't need to be considered. So what was the justification? After the memo was leaked, someone apologized saying it was intended to be ironic and that it was offered as a thought experiment. I was uh, 
chairman of the World Bank NGO committee at that time. So we faced some of them. He said, what nonsense are you talking about? You think we are rubbish? He said, uh, he said look, man, watch yourself. We're going to be after you. Later reports suggest that someone else actually wrote the memo, although someone's name appeared on it. He was saying it was not me and so on. But later he got his upcoming. After the World Bank, he went to Harvard University as president. Now, in his uh, uh, supposedly style, ironic style, he said something which cost him his job. It was at the most benign of settings, a National Bureau of Economic Research conference, but amid a sea of black and gray suits, Summers put forth some ideas about why so few women hold elite professorships in science and maths. In fact, he was saying that, I, I don't remember any woman having won the Nobel Prize at all. Okay. Ideas that sparked a national controversy. He was saying, effectively, dog whistle type, is there something wrong with women's brains that they can't reach, reach this? But now the women were not us. They were powerful. His job was gone from the presidentship of Harvard. He never went back to that. So you see the difference between the treatment between the two, right? It gets worse. We see somebody like Churchill, very revered war hero, etc., etc. In fact, there are some suggestions that sometimes he also considered to become a Muslim. So you would say that this is a probably enlightened man well with the world. Now look what he says. Chemical weapons used in Iraq. I cannot understand this squeamishness about the use of gas. He wrote in a memo during his role as Minister for War and Air in 1919. I am strongly in favor of using poison gas against uncivilized tribes. So all the Iraq is sitting here. There's your Churchill. Okay. Now you're talking about they are trying to defend uh, chemical gas use in Syria and this and that. This is their most biggest hero. If you read it in detail, it says, actually, it was not chemical gas. It was just light gas. And <coughs> but you can see the attitude is clear. These people do not, we don't need to consider them. We need to win this war. In 1919, uh, in the south of Iraq, there was this insurgency. Iraq was central to Britain's <coughs> access to India. Britain was not interested in Iraq at that time. It was interested in India. And the sea routes, land routes all went through. And Basra had that's why it become a big port. But that was his attitude. It gets worse. 1937, of course, there is a discussion on the implications of the Balfour Declaration. Because as you remember, the Balfour Declaration was saying that a homeland for the Jewish people will be created, provided it does not affect the rights and obligations to the native people, to the Palestinian people. <coughs> so he says here, let's here look, don't get too excited about this. He told the Palestine Royal Commission, I do not admit for instance that a great wrong has been done to the Red Indians of America or the black people of Australia. I do not admit that a wrong has been done to these people by the fact that a stronger race a higher grade race, a more worldly wise race, to put it that way, has come in and taken their place. And he says the same about Palestine. He said, a stronger, better race we are putting in there, so what's the problem? They will be better than these guys who have not been doing anything for thousands of years. You see the treatment of people. The mitigation would be that he wasn't particularly unique in having these views. So. Some historians have said, everybody had those views in those days, so what? But that doesn't make it right. That still makes it genocidal. Even though there were many others who didn't hold them. Then his comments on Gandhi. It is alarming and nauseating to see Mr. Gandhi, a seditious middle temple lawyer, now posing as a fakir. You know, when Gandhi used to wear this loincloth, uh, Churchill and English, they called him fakir, he said he was a beggar, yeah? 
striding half naked up the steps of the Viceregal Palace. This is the palace of the Viceroy in India, British part. Churchill said of his anti-colonial colonialist adversary in 1931, Gandhi should not be released on the account of a mere threat of fasting. Those of you know, Gandhi threatened that we will fast to death if the British don't, uh, you know, do these things. Churchill told the cabinet on another occasion, we should be rid of a bad man and an enemy of the empire if he dies. So it's better he dies. Rid of him and we don't have the problem. So it's not only Muslims. It's generally anything other than white. Now, where does it come to translate this into Muslims at the moment, Islamophobia? So as we uh, began, we said Islamophobia has now become acceptable dinner talk in the high circles. You know, when we are sitting, um, I have a friend in Bangalore University who teaches, and there were a number of Arab students, and he said, you Arabs are stupid. I said, what are you talking about? One or two students may not be good. You have to deal with Arabs. It's the kind of students you have, man. And they sued him. And they got him out of business for six months before all the inquiries were completed. And he had to go for retraining and God knows what, right? But these kind of comments have become common. Uh, Boris Johnson, for example, who is now a uh, favorite to become prime minister, uh, he talked about uh, women wearing the niqab looking like mm, bombs or letter boxes or whatever, very bad. No consequences, nothing came to him. And now he's trying to become prime minister. Or freedom of press. So they say that all these things we shouldn't stop because the press needs to be free. Fine. If you say anything about the Holocaust and you're out of business, so sometimes freedom is not advisable. Because when there is genocide as a consequence, then freedom needs to be restricted. Even if it is limiting, but this is fine. But look at the treatment of anti-Semitism versus Islamophobia, right? And you can see how this whole thing has now gravitated towards Muslims. And Muslims are game, it's fine, leave them. Now, uh, there is one, and there is one more I will tell you. Postponement of the new $20 note. So in Obama's time, they made this uh, canvassing and so on, and they wanted now to replace the $20 note. Uh, those of you who use cash in America, you will see that the most common used note is the $20, because that's the kind of amount you would be spending. So now, the new $20 note with anti-slavery activist Harriet Tubman on the front. She's a black woman slave uh, or anti-slavery campaigner as well. <coughs> Reason, uh, so it has been delayed to 2028, suddenly. So they said, well, new technology is awaited and we need to make it foolproof and this and that. But Tubman's photo was due to replace that of former president Andrew Jackson, a slave owner who is on the front of the note on the note. So you get, this is what is called dog whistle, yeah? You get subtle messages that this black campaigner for slave trade cannot go on top. Two last small points. One, two weeks ago, I saw a survey. They asked Americans, would you agree for your children to be taught Arabic numerals in your school? 75% said, no, 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 of course not. You know, these numerals, they are Arabic numerals <laughs> anyway. So you can see the ignorance of these people. It's just unbelievable. Okay, so how to solve this? Finally, to solve this, there is a couplet from Iqbal to his son, um, Justice Javed, in a book called Javed Nama. Uh, he says, look, son, the sun always rises in the east, and sets in the West. Don't forget that. 
don't run after the wind. This setting is there. But it is at its best when it is between east and west. Sarana. 